Shall we pray? <sighs> well, Lord God, we give you thanks that you have gathered us here around your word in the company of one another. We thank you that on the last night of Christ's life, he opened the door for us to peek into the throne room of the heart of God. Thank you for that privilege that we can hear these words that we can find nowhere else and pray that you would take these words and apply them to the heart by the power of your blessed Holy Spirit, in whose name we pray, amen. So continuing on in John 14, here we go from verses 15 and following. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commandments then and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but a different one, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, it's the Father who sent me. So these things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. He will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So peace I leave with you. My peace give I unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. So let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. These are the very words of the Lord himself. Well, on Tuesday mornings, we gather as pastors and staff uh, together, taking a look at the prayer request of our congregation. As you probably know, if you've been here a while, we're praying through the church membership directory about four families at a time. It takes a few years to get through the whole directory, but it's a good way uh, to connect us in love to the people that we serve. We also lift up the prayer concerns that have come in uh, from the cards uh, during the previous week. And it's a time where we get knit together and we get launched into our sense of why we do what we do, and we fall more deeply in love with the congregation that has called us here. It's a grand time, and usually it's pretty quiet time. We're, we're very focused. Underneath us, however, the Mother's Day Out program goes on. Now, it's so well run uh, by Whitney Weiner that it's usually quiet as a library there. The kids are happy. Everything's going on. I don't even realize they're there. But it's the start of the school year, and this particular Tuesday, there was a girl who was, well, not satisfied. <laughs> Actually, she was downright disconsolate. She didn't want to be there. She cried and cried and cried. I think she felt betrayed. There were arms that were holding her, but they were not her father's arms. There was a voice that was comforting her, but it was not her mother's voice. All she could think of was despair. As she cried and cried while we were praying, it sounded to me like she was saying, where are you? Why did you leave me here? Are you ever coming back? This is not right. I don't want to be apart from you. Come back. This is just irredeemably, utterly sad. It tugged on my dad's heart. I think all of us wanted to go down there and help this child. I mean, I knew in a couple of weeks she'll be bouncing into school, happy to see her friends, loving her teachers. She will have learned, oh, my mom comes back. I'm not abandoned. But for the moment, she was expressing the ache in the heart that feels like an orphan. She was doing what we have learned so well to cover over. We as adults can present the face that we're really okay, we've got it all going on. But I think in reality we have what C.S. Lewis called an inconsolable longing in the heart for we know not what. 
We're pierced with longing for something. Elsewhere, Lewis would describe it as a rapier, sword-like piercing of the heart when something triggers it, like the smell of a bonfire or the sound of wild ducks flying overhead or the title of a book called The Well at the End of the World or the sound of waves crashing against the sea or the sight of autumn leaves ready to fall. These things all pierce us and remind us of this inconsolable longing in our hearts. What are we yearning for? I think at the bottom of it, we're yearning not to be orphans, to be loved in a way that says we will not ever have to be parted again. You're not alone. There are arms that hold you. We ache for this. We pine for it, though we seldom can dare admit it. A three-year-old can point the way. So can a 75-year-old poet. Once an LSU professor of English, Robert Penn Warren, became more famous when he published All the King's Men, the novel loosely based on Louisiana Governor Huey Long. But Warren was named the first poet laureate of the United States for a reason. And in particular, his poetry, most of it very short, takes us to the place over and over again of the heart's inconsolable longing. In fact, he has numerous poems where he sets up in that lonely time that everyone has known of when you're lying in your bed and it's still dark. It's too early to get up, but you're awake. And odd questions go through your mind. Like, am I alive? What does it mean to be alive? What will it be like when I die? Am I alone? Is all my love actually getting out of my skull? Or am I just contained in myself? Are we all alone at the last? Can there be any true connection between people? He writes in one of, in deepest pre-dawn dark, you lie alone but not alone hearing frailty of breath beside you. In another, he says, you might reach over and take that hand, that fragile hand, and make a connection of intimacy in that deep, dark, pre-dawn light. But you wonder, is that connection? Or am I still alone? The heart still longs. We are still filled with the worry, the ache, that maybe we're just orphans and always will be. That, I think, is the feeling going on in Jesus' disciples, the backdrop of John 14. He has told them over and over this night, I am going someplace where you cannot follow. You will look for me and you won't find me. You will weep because I will be gone. He doesn't spare them from the realism of what's going to happen. We are going to be ripped apart from each other. Our hearts are going to break. My heart will be crushed I will suffer like no man has ever or will ever suffer again, and you will be lost. It's coming. The loneliness you fear is going to stab you in the gut. But I'm predicting it so you'll know it was planned. And I want to give you some hope. It's into all of this realism of predicting their loneliness and their mourning that he then says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. We're going to be parted, but I'm coming back. There will be arms that will be stretched out to hold you, nail-pierced hands, but they will gather you in. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'll be back. And here's the reason. Because I live, you will live also. I will die. I will be buried, I will be crushed, but I will live again. And in that, you'll find the foundation for the end of your loneliness and the hope of your life. These words are more precious than anything in this entire earth. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Because I live, you also will live. This sermon series is called The Golden Gospel because there are threads 
finer than gold of words like this that stitch through the fabric of our loneliness and our desolation and our griefs, and they can make our entire lives shimmer with God's glory. Where else in your life do you hear words like this that come with the ring of authenticity and authority? Not from your work, not from your sports teams, not from all the philosophies in all the world, not from the power to move mountains with machines or to have people move by your word to different parts of the globe. Nowhere else but from the lips of Jesus can it be said and you think he means it. It might be true. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Because I live, you'll live also. This is the golden thread of the gospel. The greatest possible hope, filled with realism. Oh yes, you will suffer. You're still going to have to face death and emptiness and suffering, but it doesn't have the last word. Death is not a final destination of darkness. It is a bridge to the brightness of my glory. Death is not a final destination of darkness. It is the bridge to the brightness of my glory. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you because I live, you also will live. He is laying down the bridge across the gap that no person can cross between even the most intimate friendships. And he's saying, I'm going to cross it in my dying and rising, all suffering will be taken up into me so that all becomes part of my life, my victory. You don't have to be an orphan. You can be a son. You don't have to be lost. You can come home. You don't have to be astray. You can be gathered in. That's what I'm doing. Because I live, you also will live. Jesus is opening up a door on the center of the reason for existence, for the universe. He's giving us a peek into what is reality. There is actually nothing more real, nothing truer, nothing more foundational than what he's going to reveal to them. Come with me. Let's take a peek inside the door, shall we? Just a quick tour of what's going on in the Gospels. In John chapter 5, Jesus says about the Father and the Son. Go ahead and stick it up there. The Father loves the Son, and He shows Him all that He Himself is doing. I, the Son, do nothing except what I see the Father doing. And the Father delights to show me what He's doing, and I delight to do His will. At the heart of the universe, the Father and the Son are loving one another showing themselves to each other, and the Son on the earth is imitating His Father in heaven. And He says, that is the whole world to me. <clears throat> that is all that I do. It is all that I want to do. Anything you see me doing, I'm imitating my Father. This is reality. <clears throat> Skip ahead then to John, actually to Matthew chapter 11, where Jesus says, the Father has given all authority to me, and no one knows the Father except the Son. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Do you see this? There is an exclusive relationship here. Nobody's getting between us. You can't reason your way inside this. You can't power drive your way inside this. You can't work your way into it. You can't achieve your way into it. We are the reality, the Father and the Son. No one gets in here unless we invite Him. So fix, fast forward to John chapter 10, where Jesus says simply, I and the Father are one. Not absorbed in each other, but so close that wherever the Father is, I am. And wherever I am, the Father is. This is reality, the love between the Father and the Son. Okay, let me show you how this works in our passage today. I want you to watch how Jesus establishes a pattern and then breaks it in order to transform our very lives. Okay, so in John 14, verse 9, he says, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. 
He says even closer language, and he said about oneness. What is it to be inside another person and the other person to be inside of you, like mutually enveloped, to not become blended, but you're still you, but it's like you're living inside the person. And the other person is still them, but living inside you so close. Believe me, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. In case you missed it, John 14, 11, he says it again. Believe me, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. He's getting a pattern going. So in John 14, 20, he says it again. Believe me, I am in the Father, and what do you want to say? You do want to say it because he set you up to hear it. I'm talking about this relationship between the Father and the Son. In fact, this week in Bible study, the guy reading it out loud actually started to say it because he was set up for it. But look what Jesus actually says. I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. From all eternity, here's the Father and the Son in this relationship of oneness and love. You can't get in there except I'm going to take you in. I am in the Father and you're in me. Wait a minute, if I'm in Jesus, where does that locate me? In the Father. The love that caused the universe to come into being is opening out and he's saying, when you're connected to me, you're inside that love. You are participating in the everlasting love relationship that's the foundation of everything. How can this be? How can this possibly be? How can you and I, scrabini people, slogging our way through the world, actually participate in this love? Well, Jesus gives two ways in John 14 how this happens. Way number one is the fact that he has overcome the estrangement between humanity and our Father in heaven. We were meant for communion with God. But when our first parents decided, my way, not your way, the curtain came down, the veil came between us, and our hearts were darkened. From that moment on, death ruled in our lives. We were cut off from the God who made us. But God hadn't stopped loving us. His heart didn't stop being open to us. His plan and desire that we should participate in His love didn't stop. He just said, all right, son, Roll up your sleeves. I want you to go down there and overcome the estrangement from their side. There's no estrangement from my side. I love them. I'm open to them. I want them. But now you go and standing in their midst in a skin suit, sweating it out, working with carpenter's hands under the curse of the law and the curse of mortality, you live out our relationship the relationship we've always had, you do it as one of them now and close the gap. Bring humanity back to me. Live out perfect obedience. Live out love and communion. Keep connected to me from their side of it and you yourself will become the atonement. Beloved, the atonement we have with God is not just a transaction, a financial arrangement of debt payment. It is an atonement in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the meeting place between God and humanity. Nobody gets between him and his Father. We want in, we have to be in him. He's closed the gap himself from our side of it. He lived as a man under curse. He died under curse of the law in order to rise, gathering it all back to himself. He overcomes the estrangement and he sends us the Spirit to join us to him. I will ask the Father, says Jesus, and he will give you another helper, the Spirit of truth, who will be with you now, and he will be in you. If you notice carefully in John 14, Jesus is promising that he will dwell in his disciples, the Father will dwell in the disciples, and the Spirit will dwell in the disciples. Everybody's going to be connected at home together. He's closing the gap. He's saying, when the Spirit gets a hold of you, you participate in my sonship. You get adopted as a member of my family, not just legally, but spiritually. I put my own spirit in you so you too cry out with me, Abba, Father, you're in. Christ establishes salvation and the blessed spirit joins us to Christ and takes us into him. So you're wondering as we close, all right, cool, that's pretty neat. I'm not living that way. I, you're, 
why? How are you talking this way? How do I get in on that? Well, Jesus is pretty clear about this in John 14 about our response to his work that gets everything activated. Love and obedience. It's like pedals of a bicycle. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The one who keeps my commandments is the one who loves me. Which comes first, it doesn't matter. But we are responding to what he has done. How can you not love someone who said, I want you to be inside me. <clears throat> I want you to be home in me. I want to fill the inconsolable longing of your heart with my presence. You don't have to be lonely for me anymore. I will fill you from the inside out. And because I live, you also will live now in fullness in the next life in eternal glory. I want you to be a son with me. My heart leaps to that. It swells to that. Who is God? He is the Father who wants his children at home with him. That makes me want to respond with obedience, which is the structure of love. I feel love for you. This is so wonderful. What do I do? Well, the obedience is the house rules. You're coming to live in the Father's house now. Just like adopted children who've been orphans, who've had a rough time of it, they don't always adjust to being in the house of love right away. It's difficult. Children who are orphaned and then taken in may resist a whole pile of new toys and say, I want this raggedy old dirty doll of mine. It's comfortable to me. They may keep on manipulating their new siblings for self-protection like they have always done to survive. They don't know how to love yet. They may resist the very love being given to them by their new parents because they don't know the rules. But as time goes on and they believe the love, they realize the house rules are the way to life. We discover that in our obedience to Christ is not restriction, but freedom. We discover that in doing his will is not the stringent dead life of myself. It's all my fulfillment. Worship is what sets my joy free. Prayer is what fills my loneliness. It's not a duty. It's living water. The golden thread of the gospel. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Because I live, you will live also. When that gets stitched into our hearts by the Spirit's work through our faith, then we understand that Jesus really meant it when he said at the end of this passage, so peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. You know that doesn't work. My peace I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Oh, Lord Jesus, we would long to cry out, Abba, Father, pick me up. Take me home. Gather me to yourself. We have an inconsolable longing that only you can fill. Lord Jesus, cleanse our sins. Dwell in us and let us dwell in you. Show us the meaning of our lives in service to you. In your name we pray, amen.